Emerging on the frontiers of science, a pioneering breed of theoretical physicists and inspired inventors are challenging the way we think about harnessing the unseen forces of nature. Despite ridicule, lack of funding, and outright suppression, they are confronting an outmoded classical worldview and ushering in a monumental scientific revolution. Most people would agree you can't get something for nothing. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And yet, we get our oxygen free from the air we breathe. We get sunlight free and water. That used to be free until bottled drinking water came along. But what about energy? We've always had to pay for that, whether it's wood or coal, oil or electricity. It's always been the rule that you can never get back more energy than what you put in in the first place. That's a fundamental law of nature. Physicists of the 19th century figured that out with the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. Maybe so. But science has come a long way since then. And laws? Well, there's never been one that hasn't been broken. No one person in the free energy field has been as determined and persistent as Mississippi inventor Joseph Newman. Since the 70s, Newman has been denied U.S. patents repeatedly on his energy machine, even though numerous engineers, scientists, and even congressmen have testified on his behalf. I started on this back in 1965, uh, picked up a book titled Energy by Life, Mag Life and uh, it had a lot of things on energy, and I had read about three or four pages uh, on magnetism. And as I read it, it was almost like a hand came out and slapped me in the face, and I realized that there was something moving in a magnetic field like a river of running water, except it was an invisible energy. And that uh, I knew this was true because they, uh, as I read the material, they said you can move a conductor at a snail's pace through a magnetic field, and lo and behold, the current take off at the speed of light. Now, that's like you telling me you're going to take a fence post and touch a rock, because I'm an old country boy, and that rock's going to take off at the speed of light. I know that's not going to occur. Something has to be going at the speed of light that is a cause that occur. Now, what came to my mind was something I observed as a, as a country boy when I used to shoot ducks on a pond with a 22 rifle. And I'd crawl on my belly and uh, get down to close to uh, about halfway down the hill and then shoot into a pond to shoot ducks when they'd I'd wait for them to come up, go under the water, and then I'd ease up real fast and shoot them. But one particular morning when I got there, I was at the proper angle. When I shot and the bullet hit the water, it deflected off and went up and started hitting the trees. And I became more interested in that fact, that that bullet would not penetrate that water at that angle, than I was shooting the ducks. Because I just couldn't believe that that bullet would not penetrate that water because I knew I could go down to the water and stick my finger in at any angle, and it wouldn't make any difference. And... Uh, I remembered that when I saw that you could move a conductor through a magnetic field at a snail's pace, and lo and behold, this current would take off at the speed of light. I knew the same thing was happening I saw as a boy when I was shooting those ducks on a pond, that there was something moving in the magnetic field already at the speed of light, and that the conductor was simply deflecting it like that water had deflected that bullet. And uh, that told me to look into this very rigorously. And so I started reading everything I could get my hands on. I'd go to the library and study. And uh, for three years, it bothered me because I read that you could move a conductor at right angles to a magnetic field and the current would go in one direction. You'd push it up and it'd go in the opposite direction. If you turn the magnet over 180 degrees, everything would reverse as far as the current going down the wire. And if you push the wire down parallel to the lines of force of a magnet, I don't care how vigorously you did it, or how fast you did it, or how much energy you used, as long as you maintain the parallel position, you wouldn't get anything. Now, that told me that there was something moving in a magnetic field at the speed of light, and that it has some kind of mechanical characteristic that caused what was observed when you moved a conductor through a magnetic field. Now, the existing knowledge, they gave you a mathematical observation of that effect, but they didn't tell you why it occurred. Now, I was most curious why did the current do what it did? How did that current know which direction to go? Why didn't it give me anything when I went parallel? And uh, I put the blame on myself at that time because I never had a physics course. I just said, I'm not smart enough to know what that mechanical characteristic is. But I was smart enough to know that there was a mechanical characteristic. So I went to the library, got a book on gyroscopes. And when I started reading the mechanical characteristics of a gyroscope, 
the question that had dogged my mind for three years, how did that current know which direction to go? And why was, why was it when you went parallel you'd get nothing? I saw the laws of a gyroscope match that exactly. If you study the laws of a gyroscope, if you take uh, this little uh, gyroscope here, if I can spin it up, you can see that it does, but I think every kid knows it's true. Now, if you pivot that one direction, it goes one way. You pivot the other way, it goes the other way. If I turn it around 180 degrees, now if I push it up, it goes the opposite direction. Push it up, it goes the opposite direction. If I go parallel, it does not pivot. As long as I maintain a parallel position, that's exactly what happens when you move a conductor through a magnetic field. You push down on it, the current goes in one direction. You push up, it goes the opposite direction. You turn the magnet over 180 degrees, everything will reverse. You push down parallel to the lines of force uh, with the copper wire, and you get nothing. It told me that the energy in a magnetic field was a gyroscopic particle. When the atoms are aligned, the magnetic field will appear, come outside the boundaries of the material, and gives you a running river that you can tap into. Now, you let the atoms disalign. You can do it by hitting it. You can put heat into it. You'll get random motion of the atoms. The magnetic field goes back into the boundaries of the material, and man does not have access to it. Now, what I'm saying that you're doing, by what you saw on these motors, you saw that I was converting mass into energy on a 100% conversion process. There's no pollution to the environment or the human race. Now, the present system of the nuclear reactor is less than 1% efficient. Over 99% of the material is contaminated, and man can't get rid of it. He's dumping it upon uh, nature and upon man at this time. And uh, or either got them in drums, and at this time, they're starting to leak. And we have a great danger from that. Now, with this energy, <clears throat> the magnitude of it is such you can do away with all pollution. It's a known scientific fact that with enough electricity, you can break any compound down to its basic element. That's known, but the cost of energy prior to this time has prohibited man from doing it. So we pollute the earth. If this technology was let loose, as it should be let loose, uh, then all of these things would be a thing of the past. Pollution would be no more. This technology explains many things in science. It explains why magnets attract and repel by the same gyroscopic particles. And Evan Soule, who helped me edit the book, had made drawings of relative what I had told him, told him that you can see it in the book, and it shows that the gyroscopic particles act just like gears do when they intersect with each other. When they come into spinning one direction, if they're spinning in the same direction like this, and they, they're coming across, if they're spinning like this, they're really going in opposite directions, you can see how that they will attract, because they, they merge together. Now, if you have one spinning one is spinning this way and the other one is spinning this way. Then what, what happens when uh, one is spinning like this and the other one is spinning like this and they come around and hit, they're going to be whether well, they repel. And so now they're both going in the same direction. As a result of it, when this one comes around and it hits this one, it's going to repel. And that's exactly what occurs. Now when they're going in opposite directions, so you have one that's spinning, it's going to be spinning this way and, and uh, the other one is spinning this way. See, this one's going this way, and this one's going this way. You can see how that they'll merge into each other and flow into each other like streams would do. And the other way, they're going to be repelling each other. When you come, come, come this way, one's coming across, it hits, and it repels. Now, there is no mechanical explanation given for these things. They give you mathematical observation of why magnets attract and repel, and say like charges are going to repel, and unlike is going to attract. But it doesn't give you any mechanical explanation. I can give you a consistent mechanical explanation with the laws of a gyroscope. Now, I didn't invent these laws, but I'm smart enough to observe them and see that they match. What happens in matter is the, uh, consist, the basic building block of all matter is a gyroscopic particle. And just like the gyroscopic particle and the wave and particle theory of matter has never been explained. And uh, if you apply the laws of a gyroscope, it explains what happens. And they notice when they have a hole going down and they have light going through it, the shadow will keep getting smaller and smaller until you get it to a certain point, And then all of a sudden, the spread way out. Now, they don't understand that. They say, so they get mixed up and say sometimes light acts like a wave and sometimes it acts like a particle. <clears throat> now, if you apply the laws of a gyroscope, it explains that to a T. When you have a large hole, you don't have any pressure or very little pressure put upon the light as it goes, squeezes through that large hole. Now, you keep getting it down smaller and smaller. It's just like a fluid. You'll notice a fluid, the velocity will get faster as you go through that little tiny hole. Now, as light tries to go through that little tiny hole, there's going to be pressure applied to its sides. As a result of it, it's going to move at right angles to that, and that's when it spreads way out. Light consists of gyroscopic particles. Light is electromagnetic energy. You're in my workshop here in Loosedale, Mississippi, and what I'm going to show you is an energy technology that's going to totally change your life. 
that the status quo power brokers have been fighting, and I'll show you the history of it. They didn't want you to have it, but you can see for yourself that this works, and the part of this for you is to see it is to watch these meters because these meters are going to show you that there's more power in this system than flows from this battery. That is two or three times more powder, power in this system than flows from this battery. And you'll notice something. When we start the machine off, you'll see the current swinging from, uh, on this DC amp meter from about 100 to 200 milliamps. Now this is a thermocoupling uh, heat meter. It's a RF amp meter. It shows you high frequencies of current, which this meter will not show you. Now you can't trick this meter because it uses a thermocoupling to produce heat and the heat converts it into electricity. Now both of these meters will be reading the true, this one will be reading the true power, this one will be reading just the current that flows from the battery. And you'll see it go up to 200 and back down to zero, showing you that the current's been reversed and this will show you what that current is. Now notice something, then when I take, and take this same system out and hook it to a little tiny toy motor, you will notice it'll be drawing about the same current that this large motor does that has a 120 pound rotary with a load on it. And it'll be drawing about the same current as this little tiny conventional motor because they believe the magnetic field comes from the current. I teach it comes from the wire and from the atoms making up the permanent magnet. That it's a little river of energy and you can tap into it. I've been working on this since 1965, um, applied for a patent in 1979, and the power brokers have been fighting it ever since. And it's, this is something that will change the world. That's why they don't want you to have it. I want you to see for yourself that it works, but to, for you to see it and to know it is to watch the meters, and then we'll hook it to this little motor, and you'll see both of the meters will read exactly the same, showing you that the meters are accurate. Because your first question will be when you see this, You'll be so dumbfounded, the average engineer will say, well, he's tricked, he's done something to the meters. So I'll just disconnect it, hook it right to that motor. You'll see the meters read exactly the same. With that, I'll start the test. And if you watch these meters, this thing wants to he hesitate around zero, you'll notice, comes down, kind of hesitates. Now this is reading, so you know how to read this meter. That's at 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, and 1,000 milliamps. And this is a milliamp meter showing up to 500 milliamps, probably about 125 milliamps. Now you take an average of this going from 200 up to 400, you're going to be up around 300 milliamps, which is more than twice the power of what you see in this system right here. Now how do you explain that unless what I teach is true, that you have the load of this 42 inch steel fan blade on this motor, and even though you do this, you see that there's more current being produced by this system then those batteries are capable of delivering because batteries will not produce RF power so the RF power must be coming from the motor now RF power is true power and the way you know this this meter only works by converting uh, into heat and the heat is converted into electricity because it runs through a resistor here it don't quite get down to 200 and gets right up close to 400 so you're going to have an average of at least 300 milliamps here so you have an average of 125 here. If you take double that, you're going to have 250 milliamps. So you're well over twice the current is flowing in this system than these batteries are capable of delivering. And the batteries cannot produce RF power. Now this is real power. It has to be coming from the system. It clearly shows that the energy output of the system is greater than the energy inputted into the system. And that's what I've been saying. That's what's more than 30 scientists who came to my home from around the world. Some of them came my way from England, signed affidavits that the invention worked. And so that the question would be asked, how do you know that this meters here haven't been tricked? And the answer to that is simple, is that we're going to disconnect it and then hook it to a conventional little toy motor and it'll be drawing close to the same kind of current. And let's see what, what we see then. You're going to see then that they read very close to the same thing. This one here, you'll notice, will be way down here, uh, probably a little bit below, 200 milliamps, and so will this one over here. 
I'm running through a 25 ohm resistor just so that you don't overload this motor here with the uh, battery voltage. Okay, now you'll see that this goes up to 200 milliamps. This one is going to about 150 milliamps. That's the 200 mark right there. So if anything, this reads just a hair low. But you can see this is no way is this more. That's 200, that's 300, that's 400. This is a little bit low, below 200 here. You've got about 185 to 190 milliamps. This is showing about 175 to 180 milliamps. But you can clearly see they're both reading accurately the same way. Now, why is it when you hook it to my machine, then you see that with the RF power, you see more than twice the power than the DC amps that's coming from the batteries. And a battery will not produce RF power. If there's any RF power produced, it must come from the system. But the system sh totally shows you that there's more power being delivered by the system, even though you have a load on it. And I have been showing this for years, and many scientists who were very qualified have testified to it. So it's not just me, but if you read my book, which, which you will be shown, you will clearly see that those men put their reputation on the line. They verified, not just with these kind of tests, but torque tests, heat tests, oscilloscope tests. I'm not running oscilloscopes because most people wouldn't understand it but the top scientists who signed the affidavits, all of them ran oscilloscope test, heat test, torque test. They all showed the same thing. And that's what this is. This meter here is a heat test because it uses a resistor, converts it into heat. The heat is converted into electricity. Now, I want you to notice something. Look at the size of the propeller on this motor. Look at the size of the propeller on this motor. Look at the mass of this motor. Look at the mass of this motor. The mass of this motor is four times as great as the mass of this motor. Look at the size of the propeller. If you were to put this propeller on this motor here and try to run it, you'd probably burn this motor up because the load would be so great. This motor here, pushing my boat out to a pipe in the middle of the pond and circling it and timing it with uh, a blue clock on the second hand, in the same length of time, I fixed it so that both motors would push the boat in the same length of time. This motor, motor here drew 12 and a half amps hooked to a 12 volt battery. This motor right here only draws seven and a half amps. And look at the size of the propeller. Look at the size of the propeller. Look at the size of the motor. Look at the size of the motor. Now this is exactly what I teach throughout my book. I taught it to Dr. Hastings. I've taught it to the world. But the larger you make the mass, then the, the smaller amount of power it will take and the more power it will produce. And just like I teach in the patent, that this, these are the law of levers that the energy in a magnetic field is just like an invisible wrench. It is a mechanical entity that it is real, and the bigger you make it, the more torque you're going to have, and the more power you're going to have. And if I made a call as big as a whole city, uh, with a magnet in it proportionally, the power it would be would be phenomenal, and it would use less power than the other little, mag the other little motors that I'm using, or less power than this little motor right here, for a simple reason. The energy does not come from the current. It comes from the atoms making up that mass. The only mistake was made back, was back in 1820 that they made the mistake that they believed the current came, uh, the magnetic field came strictly from the current and the coil was dormant like a water pipe carrying water. Now what I had showed Dr. Hastings was that if you use iron, what you have to do is you use copper. And the bigger the iron, the more copper you'd have to use so that you'd mass, you would outline the atoms of that mass. And I've taken the armatures out of these motors went to a uh, Fox Marine in Mobile, got them. He was very helpful. He gave them to me. And I see that they have done exactly what I have said. And the small ones that, they, that they're making now, they'll have 12 pieces of iron and they use fine wire. They go to a, a mini coil 99. It's got 10 pieces of iron and it's got bigger gaps in it so they can use larger wire, get more wire, have greater mass of wire as well relative to the iron and they use very little current. As I get the armatures of their motor from Fox Marine and Mobile, this is the motors that they're making right now that's a smaller motor, like this one right here. Now you'll notice that they have 12 pieces of iron. If you count them, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 pieces of iron that they have in this one. So the spaces between it is small, and notice they use small diameter wire. 
Now this is a lot bigger one. This is uh, Mini Coder 99. You'll notice now they only have 10 pieces of iron. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the gaps in between it is greater. Notice the diameter of the wire. The wire is bigger so that they can get more wire, greater mass inside of here, so the power that is utilized will be less. The diameter of this is larger, so they have more torque. If they wanted more power, now this motor, the bigger the motor, the less power it will use, and they'll still use less power than this one. They have done exactly what I said do. Now you can take this to the nth degree, and that's what I'm going to build. How do you use iron? How do you, what do you do when you use iron? And uh, he asked me, if you use more iron, do you have a greater, ma is your magnetic field greater? I said, sure it is, Roger. I said, just think about what I told you. I said, uh, the magnetic field, I don't care if it's from iron, I don't care if it comes from a conductor, I don't care what it comes from, the more the mass, the greater the magnetic field that you're going to have. And uh, see, the, we had even built some down here, but we couldn't get uh, this iron here in larger pieces because this is uh, lamentations. You have to have a die made, you've got to have a good bit of money to uh, stamp these things out, and uh, then each one of the lamentations is, is insulated. That's to keep uh, the eddy currents that occur without the lamentations that acts as a braking effect upon this system, and the way they do it is that way. But what I do give Roger Hastings credit for is that he mastered exactly what I taught to a T, why everybody else acted like this ought to be complicated, it ought to take a genius to do it. Uh, and I kept telling anybody I can teach a monkey to wrap wire uh, it doesn't take any genius. Evans heard me say that a million times. I've said it on many talk shows. I've said it in my writings. And I didn't understand why people wouldn't come forward and get behind it. My life's work, I was so dedicated to what I was doing. So when I started on this in 1965, I was wise enough to know not only did I have to understand the energy in a magnetic field, but I had to mechanically understand any energy I'd place in that magnetic field just like placing a uh, water wheel in water. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you put water, a water wheel at right angles to that, so that it's running this way, and running water, it'll sit there and vibrate, but it won't rotate. You have to put it so that the blades are going to be caught by the water and make it rotate, and it'll do work for you. I knew also the same thing was true of a magnetic field. So I worked from 1965 to 1979 before that I ever applied for a patent. And then I applied for a patent. I didn't have the need to build it because I knew that I was right. Uh, my patent attorney told me nobody's going to believe this unless you build it. I built it. It worked exactly as I said it would. The first time that I knew I had put forth a unified field theory in my honest effort, and I didn't set out to, to do this, it was my honesty to understand matter. It was Dr. Smith, who was chief of space and environment branch at Huntsville, uh, Alabama, who brought this to my attention. I met him in 1976. And we discussed my work quite often and uh, for over a two-year period, and he did everything he could to help me. Uh, he had uh, some other scientists read my work to, to try to debate with me. And it was they who brought this to my attention, that they would not even attempt to debate with me because it, my logic was so rigid. But they were familiar with mathematical formulas, and I didn't use any, but that they wished to compliment me for my unified field theory that I was putting forth. That's what the first time it dawned on me that I had put forth a unified field theory because I was working on the energy source. It was just my honesty to understand ma all of matter, um, just like one to put in a water wheel in the water. It was my same logic that caused me to do this, and Dr. Smith's people brought it to my attention. And uh, it's, uh, my life's work is very diverse and it's very uh, great for all humanity, and it is a mechanical explanation. It is a unified field theory. Uh, not only does it explain the wave and part of theory of light, but uh, Joseph Black, who existed uh, well over 100 years ago, was a brilliant man. He saw that matter, and he, um, it was obvious to me as I read of Joseph Black, he understood that matter uh, did consist of E equals mc squared because he talked about heat and et cetera. Now, heat is gyroscopic particles. Uh, when you compress materials, they don't just get cool. Uh, and they, they say they get hot, they get cool. And you take a bicycle pump and pump it up, and people think that it's getting hot. No, it's cooling down. The way you know it's cooling down is because it is hot. It gives off heat to you, but the gas cools down as you compress it. Materials do as you react upon them. Now, you'll feel the heat 
and just like a piece of ice, uh, it's not, it's warming up when you touch it because it pulls heat from you and it's cold. But if you were the ice, I'm warm to it. So it warms up. And it's all of this is gyroscopic particles. When you do pressures on matter, it will react to that force in accordance with E equals mc square. Now, Joseph Black talked about this years ago. And what I do in this book, I, just, I incorporate his work with my work. Now, Dr. Smith also brought something else who was, who was chief of space environment branch at NASA because I had shown the Earth's true axis and magnetic axis are all one and the same that the Earth's true axis is a result of the Earth's magnetic axis being warped in outer space and aligns with the sun's magnetic field. And I did this by taking the known mathematical explanations and uh, numbers that are given on their angles and put them together and shown that there are mathematical odds of against accidental currents of better than 29 million to one. I did the same thing with the moon's angles relative to the Earth and its true axis and that those angles equal the mathematical odds was well over 20, 20 billion to one. Now, Dr. Smith had his statisticians look at those numbers and said the chances of me being wrong was almost impossible. And uh, this was uh, back in 1986, I think it is. And you can see that there's an uh, inflated uh, uh, helium balloon. And I wrapped it with wire until it would get heavy and lay down on the floor. Then when I hooked it to a 250 volt battery, it would rise. If I changed the polarity of it, it'd turn around 180 degrees. I could uh, just pulse laser it and make it come down and hover. I could disconnect it and make it come back down to the ground. And Dr. Hastings took the weight of this and weighed it on a letter scale. And from this, he calculated that a device 200 foot in diameter, 30 feet thick, would lift a 200 ton payload. Now see, this can be made and brought forward. Now the government is busy about fighting all of this technology, so it leaves all of this stuff out. It's not brought out to the public. It's not advanced forward because they don't want the people to have it. Now, as this technology comes forward, all of these things will come to be that I talk about. Now, the magnitude of this technology, because it, uh, you know that you can take uh, enough electricity and break any compound down to its basic elements, uh, there'll be no pollution. But likewise, you can take salt water and convert it into fresh water. I have already done that. Take water, hook it in line with these systems because of the high voltage. It will break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. And when you make a spark with the system itself it will produce, it'll give you back an explosion, which would run a piston, and give you back the same energy, which would run a pump. Uh, and then you have fresh water. So I could envision tremendous sized motors on salt, uh, on um, places that are deserts along salt water. And building, they'll be, uh, the motors will be larger than these buildings. And it'll convert salt water into fresh water and still pump the pump and pump it inland to, to deserts and et cetera, and those deserts will be turned into oases. You see, all of this can come be if this technology is released to the magnitude that I'm saying it should be. All matter and air consists of electromagnetic energy, and there is energy there. But the Earth's magnetic field is weak across any one point, and it's massive across a large area. That's why that when I built this space to Christ, the thing was interesting to me, when I built it, uh, and I applied for a patent on it, I noticed that what I drew uh, matched exactly what people have seen, said they have seen in spacecrafts. And I say, I didn't notice that until I drew it, because it's just like uh, mechanically, I look at everything mechanically, was that I knew when a man wears sh snowshoes, he's not going to put his foot on the outer periphery of it, he's going to put his foot in the center of it. So I put the payload in the center of it and let the mass of the uh, wiring, et cetera, go out over a large area but I put the weight in the center so that you would have a balanced unit. Now, as I drew it, though, and after I had drew it, you know, and made it the way I saw it in my mind, I noticed that I had drawn the same sh shape of a spacecraft that people have said they have seen. I remember when I met Dr. Smith, I didn't believe in space people, and, uh, who was chief of space at Brighton Vance at NASA. And uh, he said, Joe, why don't you? You're an intelligent person. Why don't you believe in it? I said, well, the main reason I don't, Dr. Smith, is that uh, why don't they come down and talk to us? And I had been telling him when I met him how refreshing it was, it was to meet a scientist who thought, because I had been to the physics department, I'd been to the astronomy department of all the colleges here in the South. They'd all say, Joe, you in the, if I got physics, they'd say, go to the astronomy department. You got astronomy in here. I go to the astronomy department and say, Joe, you got physics. Go to the physics department. I got the runaround. And he said, Joe, you've just been spending five minutes telling me how you was complaining about the scientific community. 
did not think and didn't question and didn't want to debate new ideas with you. He said, now, if you were these people from out of space, would you bother to come down and talk with them? And that really hit me hard. <clears throat> I said, Dr. Smith, I said, I never thought about it. I said, you were right. I said, no, I wouldn't talk with them. I said, I wouldn't talk with them. There could be uh, ships that would be made to carry freight. There would be no pollution to the earth. You don't need roads. You don't need all this uh, wreck, wrecks and et cetera that occur. You'd have a very safe means of travel. travel uh, <clears throat> that the technology goes forward. Traveling to the moon would be commonplace. That's the magnitude of all of this. <clears throat> See, our government should be behind it. The, uh, the people should wake up to the magnitude of it. Uh, and share this knowledge with one another because that's the way that you're going to get it. This through shows like this, but then you need to follow it up, read these books for yourself, tell your friends, run the test for yourself. Anybody can repeat this test. <clears throat> I tell you how to take the fine wire. It was 30 gauge wire. You wrap it around in a little inflatable uh, balloon that, with helium that you can get from any balloon shop, and you wrap it until it falls down to the floor. And it's rinsed, then it reaches the floor, then you hook it to a, to a 250 volt battery, it'll rise. You change the polarity, it'll turn around 180 degrees and you postulate it, you can make it come down and hover. You disconnect it, it'll come back down to the floor. And like I said, Dr. Hastings took that and it, laid, weighed it on a bathroom, I mean, excuse me, on a letter scale, and from that weight, he calculated what its lift was mathematically. And that's when he said a device 200 foot in diameter, 30 feet thick, would lift a 200 ton payload, based on his mathematics. And I guarantee you other scientists have paid close attention to what he said, and it's being utilized but it's not being utilized for the advancement of the whole human race. And I've said, I have given this for all people. Um, it's a new means of transportation without pollution to the earth um, and a better means of transportation. We don't have to have roads that we're consistently breaking. You give you a lot more space. People can run at different heights, different levels, just like you do on planes, but you don't have the danger of the falling and the et cetera that you do. You can reach speeds way beyond what you can use, reach with any combustible device uh, because the Earth's magnetic field uh, and totally encompasses the Earth. The Sun totally encompasses all the planets. The <coughs> galaxy's magnetic field engulfs all of the, the solar systems, and I'm certain the galaxies rotate around some other central body, that the entire universe is prevailed by electromagnetic field. Therefore, with an electromagnetic device, it is obvious to me that you can travel through this entity. And just like Einstein had concluded that uh, you could not uh, exceed the speed of light, I am certain that you can exceed the speed of light. Because I just like I write in this book, anything that you can imagine is probably possible by, any, by some means, and I'm certain it can be. And the way I could see it could be done is on a basis that you have a device that puts out electromagnetic field. The reason that I'm certain the mass, like Einstein said, would get bigger and bigger and bigger is because the universe consists of gyroscopic particles. And I can see as you start reaching the speed of light, then at that point, the energy and the magnetic field of the galaxy of the universe will start combining with that mass, and the mass would become greater. We should open our eyes and our brain to see the magnitude of what lays in front of us. Space travel will become a reality. Uh, our children growing up will have an excitement and a, uh, a universe to travel into, but the values of the human race has to change with that. Let me just give the facts and let Y'all kind of draw your own conclusion. I applied for the patent uh, back in 1979, and uh, just like my patent attorney told me, nobody wasn't going to build it, believe me, unless I built it. So I started building the prototypes after I applied for the patent. And uh, the patent law states that uh, the patent office has no facilities for testing the invention, so they must depend upon the applicant to submit affidavits of operability of the invention. And just like my patent attorney told me, especially something like this, where you're claiming more energy out of the system than you externally and put it into the system. So I put the information out to many people to come forward on the news, national news, uh, radio shows, and et cetera. I had people come all the way far away as Europe to come and test the invention. These are scientists who came not believing. They came uh, what I call a, a true scientific mind. They came disbelieving. But over 30 scientists came to my home, signed affidavits that the invention worked. They ran uh, tests of operability, of heat tests, torque tests, oscilloscope tests. And they all knew the magnitude of what they were attesting to. And they signed their name and their reputation that indeed this in invention worked as I said it did. And they all understood the magnitude of what they were saying. They were uh, risking their, their reputation that they had worked hard and went to school to, to gain. And uh, I love these men who done this. And there was one girl who also put her reputation up uh, who had uh, engineering experience. 
and uh, I love them for doing that. And I sent it to the patent office in good faith. Now the patent office responded uh, and implied that uh, there was some type of conspiracy that we were incompetent or either they had conspired with me that they didn't believe it, they wouldn't accept the affidavits, now, which was against the patent law itself. Uh, the examiner had told me right up front, I don't think I'll ever be able to uh, give you a patent no matter what evidence you present to me. Uh, when I went to the board of uh, a board before them, they uh, admitted when I had complained about the examiner, I went in front of a board and the board uh, agreed that uh, the invention worked and uh, had read my work. In fact, one of the guys there complimented me, said that your logic is indisputable. I've read your literature, which was made a part of the patent. And uh, he said, however, you have not uh, written it so someone could build it. So they denied the patent. So I, then I went to the Board of Appeals, and uh, then the Board of Appeals said, no, no, uh, we agree that anybody could build it based on your description. Uh, However, the invention simply cannot work. It's impossible. And so they just told me it was a flip-flop type of a deal. So then I went to federal court. I went to federal court. Uh, there was an, uh, a judge who said he had no mechanical expertise and so that he wanted a special master. That uh, special master was a Mr. William Schuyler. He had been a former commissioner of patents in 1970. He was an electrical engineer. The judge chose him saying his credentials were superb. He was nominated by the U.S. Patent Office. Now, Mr. Schuyler very quickly gave those men the credit that they were due. He came back saying that the evidence was overwhelming that the invention worked, that there was no contradictory factual evidence, that the patent office had normally not followed the formalities of the patent law, and the patent should issue. Now, the federal judge knew that the federal law says that uh, if he hires a special master in the absence of a jury, he must accept that master's finding unless clearly erroneous. Now, the way the U.S. Patent Office responded to the judge is the judge should refrain from believing in the tooth fairy. Now, that is no kind of credible evidence, as you know it isn't. Now, the judge threw out that special master's findings. He uh, uh, sent it to, uh, back to the Patent Office, and uh, the National Bureau of Standards was told to uh, test the invention. Now, they came out, the National Bureau of Standards came out right up front telling the court that I was a fraud. They wanted the right to destroy the machine, uh, that I wouldn't be available when any testing was made, uh, and that they could totally destroy it and not give it back to me. And uh, I filed a writ of mandamus against the judge, and uh, twice I filed a writ of mandamus against him. I was told by attorneys that judges would try to protect judges with more vengeance than attorneys did attorneys or doctors did doctors. I found that to be the case, but even in one place, the uh, higher court did uh, agree with what I said. They said the judge uh, was also not only violating the law, but he was violating good conscience because to take the invention away from me, not allow me to be present when uh, it could be tested. So they had 30 days and they asked me would I send it under their guidelines that they had, uh, I would be present whenever that they were going to test it. They couldn't destroy it and they had to give it back to me. They had 30 days to do that. And uh, they would call us at the last minute when they got ready to do a test. I'd be way down here in uh, Loosedale, Mississippi, and say they're going to have a test within two hours. My attorney is up in Washington, and uh, all my people that I had uh, credible scientists with me were scattered across the nation. And they knew I couldn't make it. But they never did test. And then they, in 30 days, we went to pick up the machine. My attorney did, and he was held in contempt by the judge. He violated the higher court's order and they kept the machine 180 days. And then they said it didn't work, and they said they grounded the machine. Now everybody out there, and every engineer out there knows, a ground has only one purpose, and that's to dump excess energy. Therefore, if you have a machine that you know is producing excess energy, and you put a ground to it, what are you gonna expect is gonna occur? It's gonna dump the excess energy. Every test they ran, they grounded the machine. The machine should not be grounded, the test should, the, of every machine should be isolated from ground so you can get the true readings of what's going on. Any engineer out, engineer out there knows that. They knew that. Now they kept it for 180 days and then they wanted to charge me $100,000 for testing this machine. They sent a marshal to my home right here uh, with a command from the court to get my papers on my house, my car, and everything else and bring it uh, to the court. 
Now, the attorney I had told me, Joe, you better file bankruptcy. Uh, so I had to file bankruptcy in Mississippi. Any other bill I owed, I paid it. Now, the court agreed with me that uh, uh, I didn't have to give up my home or anything else. Uh, and uh, because I got on the radio shows across the nation and started telling the people what the government was doing, they dropped uh, that lawsuit for me to pay them $100,000. Now, any engineer out there knows, or any person out there, if you have an electrical motor, you can call any electrical engineer, and you ask him which way is his current going in this motor. He can come over in 15 minutes and hook an instrument on your device and tell you right quick which way that current's going. And it was a total ripoff of passing the buck they, they wouldn't even look at, I brought the invention. They wouldn't allow the invention to be demonstrated in the Senate hearing room. Uh, they didn't want to do any test on it. The National Bureau of Standards was there. The Patent Office representatives was there. Uh, all they did was just talk about what the purpose of the Patent Office was and little things they did. They talked as little as possible about my energy invention. This is the trade that's going on. Now, what's interesting, I had uh, 11 congressmen introduce bills in the Congress that issued Joseph Newman a pioneering patent. Uh, the Republican uh, Party itself wrote uh, uh, a deposition about what had occurred and said that uh, my rights and the patent procedure had been violated rel relative to uh, this uh, invention. But neither the Democrats or the Republicans, either one, didn't do anything to correct this injustice. The Patent Office does not guarantee the validity of a patent, uh, so they're not out anything. It's like uh, another gentleman who had been an expert advisor to the Judiciary Committee on patent law. His own tape uh, in Washington, D.C., when I came out from a uh, court hearing, said it was atrocious what had happened relative to me. Long ago, the patent should have issued. The day will come that man will work one hour a day to have all the materialistic things that he wants and that their wives want and their children want. And then they can spend the rest of their time doing something constructive in life from one human being to another one. Uh, that's the magnitude of what this technology will be. It'll do away with pollution. It'll turn deserts into oases. And um, the patent office procedure should cause you to know the magnitude of it or why else would they have fought me so hard? Because the jewel of our civilization is its created people. And I want to stand my ground so that this will never be done to another human being again. And all you people out there, I'd like you to think about something. Everything you've got, there's no politician who's given it to you. There is no dictator who's given it to you. There's no president who's given it to you. It's been created people throughout history who spent their life, have been trampled on. And, I don't, and if you look across the spectrum, I don't care if it's in physics, chemistry, astronomy. I don't care if it's in music. I don't care if it's in art. Look back through history. Look how these people have suffered. Every time they've done something, and even bees know that... Uh, have enough sense to protect this queen bee. The jewel of its civilization is your creative people. See, I'm standing my ground in such a way, when you look at my life, I want you to look at something. Make sure after I'm dead and gone that no other human being will ever go through this again. If you were fascinated by the amazing technologies and concepts you've just witnessed, now you can get even more valuable information and details from the new energy series. Five full-length videos, nine hours of in-depth conversations and demonstrations of free energy systems. Explore the worlds of inventors and theoretical physicists who are changing the paradigms of science. Volume one all, features we'll Tom Bearden. In particle physics, any electrical charge is automatically a broken symmetry. Now, what this means is there is a virtual photon flux, a violent flux exchange between the vacuum itself, which is filled with this virtual photon flux. Volume 2, John Hutchison. I feel that that is also true. I think the Mayan connect is also a uh, coherer of frequencies and transmit them out and then lock this doorway into space and time. This motor here drew 12 and a half amps. Volume 3, Joseph Newman. This motor right here only draws 7 and a half amps. And look at the size of the propeller. Look at the size of the propeller. Look at the size of the motor. Look at the size of the motor. Now, this is exactly what I teach throughout my book. I taught it to Dr. Hastings. 
I've taught it to the world, but the larger you make the mass, then the, the smaller amount of power it will take and the more power it will produce. Volume we'll 4, four highlights type. Troy Reed. This is an old mechanical device. It's got, it's got two inner wheels on the inside and two outer shell wheels with magnets. They got eight magnets on this side, eight magnets on the inside here. Let's see what kind of torque we got at 75 PSI. In volume you 5, Dennis Lee. Okay, here it goes. <laughs> Maxed it out. So it went all the way off the end of this thing, 150 foot-pounds of torque. This engine They're just twenty nine ninety five for each take. Now the process or get here, all five for uh, one hundred nineteen ninety five. A savings of thirty dollars. Place your order cycle. today. Call one eight hundred seven nine five tape T A P E. A right to Lightworks Audio and Video, Post Office Box six six one five nine three, Los Angeles, California nine zero zero six six. And now you can order this and many other fine tapes on the internet at www.lightworksav.com. That's lightworksav.com, as in Lightworks Audio and Video.